We're running. Okay. So welcome everybody to uh, to this webinar with uh, Elliot Connie, someone who I've been following for a long time, and anyone who's in the solution focus world would know he's probably one of the hardest working people out there. I mean, uh, the amount of uh, information that Elliot puts out is 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 really admirable, and uh, it's he's so giving with with his knowledge and information so we're really really pleased to have him here uh it's a bit like being a bit starstruck um, I'm not. <laughs> so um might be a good place to start if um because a lot of people will know you from the solution focus world elliot but uh, a lot of people watching may not may think well, why are they so starstruck about this guy uh <laughs> So, uh, yeah, introduce yourself. Tell us, um, tell us obviously what you're doing, uh, any exciting new things coming up, and um, maybe how you got into this approach in the first place, because I know you didn't train in this approach initially. No, no. All right, so I'm going to give you like a super long answer, I guess. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so, yep, my name is Elliot Connie. I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts. I consider Massachusetts my hometown. I consider myself currently a citizen of the world, even though I'm currently residing here in Texas. And uh, the way I came to Solution Focused, uh, I was originally trained in cognitive behavioral therapy. I tell people all the time, I fell in love with helping mm -hmm. while, while doing cognitive behavioral therapy, even though I knew cognitive behavioral therapy was not a good fit for me. I was someone, I've had such a shit life. Like I was born in Chicago, Illinois, but my mom and dad had the worst marriage in the history of bad marriages. Like the type of marriage that if I could go back in time, I would like murder the priest who married my, my parents. Like they should never have been together. Um, and my father was abusive all throughout my childhood, uh, very physically, verbally abusive. And, um, I learned very quickly that I'm so miserable and I'm so unhappy and I'm so deeply troubled. The only thing that seemed to impact me was when I did something to make somebody else smile, which by the way, I think is, I think is very common. If you think of your favorite like comedians, they're usually yeah. people with a difficult background because they understand the value of a smile and they became gift making people smile. I think I developed the gift of making people smile in a very different way. And um, of course, I didn't know anything about psychotherapy theories. I thought counseling was counseling. So when I went to graduate school, they taught me how to do CBT. And um, I didn't like it because I had to view people through the lens of problems. And I was aware that I didn't like when people viewed me through the lens of problem. And I didn't like the way it felt when I viewed people through the lens of problem and deficit. Um, so I was really thinking about quitting school and thankfully my university hired a professor, a woman by the name of Linda Metcalf, who, uh, did solution focus. This was all the way back in like 2004. And it was the first time I'd heard somebody talking about helping someone without viewing the person you're helping through a deficit lens. Mm -hmm. And again, I had no idea what she was doing, but it just sounded like you're helping someone while not holding the belief that they they need to depend on your help mm. and i was so intrigued by that that i i approached her and i said like i'm thinking about quitting school but i'd love to talk about what you do before i do and we started having conversations about it and when i came when i when i was learning about this approach it just sounded like someone had put in a book the type of counselor i've dreamed of being mm. yeah. so i so i i just started like that was it, you know. Once I learned that, I, I couldn't I couldn't turn it off. Like mm -hmm. I, I couldn't help. It. And I'm so like I believe in it so much. Like I can't help but share it. Like I just want everybody to do it, mm -hmm. which is which, how I use my platform. You know, like I want everybody to have access to quality solution focused training. Whether you live in England, U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, doesn't matter. I, if you are interested in helping someone, I want somebody to know this beautiful way of helping people exists. And I spend a lot of my time and energy trying to give people access to it. Mm. And we thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Thank, uh, <laughs> thank you. Like, like I said, uh, the, the, 
the amount of, of uh, information that you've put out there is, is amazing. Um, so, I, I, and I know, um, I know obviously you do loads of training, but in your private practice, is that right? You specialize in couples? Well, yeah, well that's a good question. I specialize in couple just because I'm willing to see them. Like most people in the field don't like seeing couples. <laughs> and I was willing to see them and I love seeing couples. And um, what happened was I couldn't find any books, right? So I opened my private practice and I'm super excited. I'm like, man, I got my office. I just need people to come and see me. And what ended up happening was a bunch of men were dragged into my office by their <laughs> ear by the wife. <laughs> And the men would tell me, the men would tell me that I was afraid to go see a woman because I thought my wife and the therapist would gang up on me. You were one of the only <laughs> therapists that would see us as a couple, so here I am. So I thought, well, I need to figure out how to do this. I need to figure out how to do this work. Mm-hmm. And back then, all of the solution-focused books were were very like one therapist talking to one client kind of a context. Yeah, I yeah. found some books by Michelle Weiner Davis, whom I love and. Um, I've gotten to know her personally, and I, I think the world of her, but her books are like self-help books to the actual couple. Mm-hmm. And I needed a book that would help me, the professional, have a solution-focused conversation with the couple. Um, so I couldn't find the book, so I wrote it. So mm-hmm. um, that's, how, that's how my specialty became couples. Just because I was willing to do it, I got so fascinated by it, and when I didn't think there was another book out there about it, I wrote the book. Wow. <laughs> I love that. It wasn't there, so I decided to write one. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> that's exactly right. It did not exist, so I yeah, decided I would write. Yeah, but that's brilliant. And that, that's kind of like one of the reasons why you kind of inspire all of us, because you, you do have that uh, aspiration and inspiration to make that difference, but not, but in a good way. You, you want to mm. share the love almost. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. 100%. I, I no longer really care if people remember my solution focused ideas. I want them to remember how Elliot inspired me and Elliot loved me. That's what I want. Yeah. Which, yeah. which you know, is, and I, you know, I, I'm meant to not be talking much because I'm meant to be doing behind, behind the scenes stuff, but it's Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some of you, I'm going to say this for the fourth time, I think, to Elliot, but I really want to put it out there. I think Elliot has uh, the brief team. Um, really have inspired us and, and trained us and, and done amazing work. Um, and they are, you know, the brief and SFBT and all the other practitioners are fantastic. But Elliot was the turning point for for me. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know about Joy, but he was a turning point for me where I took five minutes of Elliot talking. This was about four years ago. And I just went, oh, mm-hmm. got it. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. Now I'm a true believer. Now I yeah. get it now. And it was from that moment that I thought, right, okay, I, I feel confident to give this a go. So um, mm. for all the families that we worked with, it's because of Elliot. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why we're you, good. That, that means a lot to me because it doesn't sound like it's really easy to like, shift your mind. <laughs> so I'm no, glad. I, yeah, it wasn't easy. It yeah, wasn't yeah, easy. Yeah. I mean, about anything, right? About anything. You you are a very strong-willed human. I don't know so what I'm makes glad. you say that, Elliot. I mean, Joe would, totally, Joe would totally disagree with you. No. Really? Somehow, <laughs> somehow I can feel better disagree with you. Uh, disagree with me. But just so, a hunch. Just a hunch. Just a, I, I, think, I think your hunch is probably correct. Mm. Anyone disagrees, mm-hmm. then feel free to say, no, she's not like that at all. But uh, no one's disagreeing so far. Yeah. Um, so so with couples, what, what are we talking about with couples, guys? How do we stop couples from killing each other? Um, are you asking me or Joe? Both of you. Go for it. Mm-hmm. I just ask silly questions and you guys just uh, go for it. Yeah. I, um, I mean, because <clears throat> we, we are supporting families via Zoom and I know it's uh, – um because we were speaking earlier that it's it's a different way of working but also one that's had its benefits uh i think i think one of the main things is because you're all um it 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 seems to make people listen more over this medium because one person has to speak at a time whereas when you're in a live situation often doesn't work that way uh so 
it's definitely, um, I think this period has given people so much opportunities to listen to each other and and to 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 find out things about each other that they never knew before because we're in such close proximity towards each other. Um, I, um, I mean, we work with families and obviously couples are involved with that. Um, I am working with a couple at the moment and my, I went to your question, Elliot, you know, which one? What, how did you guys meet? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which, uh, which changed the whole, cause it was very problem saturated and it changed the whole conversation on its head almost. Um, you could see, um, you could see the wife light and there was, there was a smile on her face. Um, and you know, she'd, she'd met her husband on a bus on a, on a, <laughs> and exchanged numbers. And I'm going, wow, you just gave your number to a stranger on a bus. What was it about him that made you do that? So it was, a, it just, it, it was just thinking of you that it came into my head and I got something's got to change here because this conversation is going downhill fast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thank you. I, I thank you for that. I think, I think um, your words were to me, Joe, I pulled an Elliot. I pulled an Elliot on them, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I love it. Yeah. And uh, they were, I, I think, I, I, I think they've got to that point. I don't know if, uh, if, if you see this in couples, you know, where, um, the problems have been going on for so long that no one almost wants to admit that uh, at one time they were in love, that there was there was something about each other that that drew them together, and this this constant bickering over years you kind of forget that. So that was a lovely way of reminding them that at, at, at some point in time there were qualities about this other person that you appreciated. Absolutely, I. Um, I don't think I've ever met a person who can describe the moment they met their partner without a smile. Yeah. Uh, even, even no matter how mad or angry you are, but you ever, okay. Do, do, do I, I know that do both of you have kids, right? Do I have that right? Do we buy five? What? Sorry. It went blurry. Children. Children? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you know that moment when your child, you are not giving your child something that they want, right? Like the child wants this new toy or they want extra cookies or whatever, and you say no, mm. and the child is like working really hard to be <laughs> mad at you. <laughs> and then you do something that they enjoy, and you see the smile bursting through the wall of, of anger because they can't help it because you've just done something you really enjoy. Mm. My mother is like a hero to me. Cause I told you guys, I had such a horrible childhood. My dad was super abusive. When I was about 10 years old, I decided I was gonna run away. So uh, I packed all of this stuff into this little duffel bag. I'll never forget this. When you're 10 years old, like the things that are important are not like food. It was more like I'm bringing my favorite toy and I'm bringing my favorite <laughs> You know what I mean? Like I put all this stuff in this little duffel bag and I hid the duffel bag under my bed. Now my mom, being a very attentive mother, knew that I was up to this weird kind of plan. So what does my mother do? My mother makes my favorite dinner, which was spaghetti at the time. And I was sitting in my room thinking, I'm running away tonight. And I'm like, what's that I'm smelling? <laughs> spaghetti. And before I know it, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna run away later. Okay, maybe tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like my mother had just used this idea of you can't hold a, a negative thought and a positive thought in your brain at the same time. Mm. So when you're working with a couple, and even if they want to absolutely rip each other's faces off, if I say something like, yeah, I get it. You want to rip his face off? I would too. But before you rip his face off, would you mind sharing with me how you met this person? and the relationship started and grew before the problem came that made you want to rip his face off <laughs> tell me about how you met him in the first place i've never met someone who didn't smile mm. it's just, it's like it's a nearly impossible thing like you you smile when you talk about how you met how you met people 
It's just it's just what happens. Yeah, yeah. When you met people who have a positive influence on your life, by the way, uh, mm-hmm. but you smile. Uh, Chris Iveson ha- has had a major impact on my life, personally and professionally. And if I tell you how, to, how I met him, I couldn't help but smile. Uh, today, today is my best friend's father's birthday. He turned 70 years old today. His name is Stephen Crandall. If I told you how I met Stephen Crandall, I have no idea how to tell you that story without loving Stephen Crandall just a bit more and thus smiling. So your romantic relationship is the same. It's the exact same. Even if your partner cheated, even if your partner lied, even if your partner, whatever, like you just can't help it. Your mm. brain has to smile. That is just what we do. Yeah, and and uh, I, I saw that in action um, personally. So I know I know how powerful a question that can be. Um, and I was uh, <clears throat> when me and Aisha knew. Well, when I knew you was coming on, I thought fantastic because obviously now in in this lockdown situation um there are so, <laughs> there are so many opportunities for us to annoy each other <laughs> and, <laughs> yes true uh, and um you know if if you're a couple going through this it's it's really it's a really good reminder of uh, what it is that that uh, that not only not only when we first met but what what kept us going for the second date and the third date and the fourth mm-hmm. date and and, and so on so um in terms of uh people I, I i i know you're still working privately um and like many practitioners now we're doing things over zoom and that i'm just wondering um what's what have you found out there in terms of couples in lockdown how are you supporting them what would you advise others in that situation where they're finding it a bit of a struggle really i would say so I, I honestly, in my work, I have not experienced it as that different. Mm. Um, so I would say, to me, love is love. You know what I mean? Like love, uh, love is is love is the most powerful thing that has ever happened on earth. Uh, mm. Love is what makes the world go round. Love is what makes us do hard things. Love is what makes us unselfish. Love is what makes us dedicated and devoted. And so for me, the center part of my work with couples has always been the onset of love. And whether I'm doing that on Zoom or whether I'm doing that in a face-to-face session, it's the same. Mm -hmm. Because that same thing happens. If I ask a couple, what do you best hope from our talking? They're still frustrated. I want him to stop doing whatever, and I want her to stop doing whatever. And then when we get a nice outcome, and I say, when you first met your partner, because you can put so much emotion in questions. Mm-hmm. If I could tell someone, when you first met your partner, and I understand that things got wobbly at some point along the way. Um, but when you first met your partner, what did you first notice about him or her? that let you know he was a, he or she was a good candidate to create a family with. Mm. Changing the way people talk. And it doesn't matter whether you're on Zoom or face-to-face. Like, you guys are, are professional partners, and as we talked, I'm sure you want to choke each other every now and then. <laughs> but, but there are certain assumptions I hold in my head that must be true. And one of those assumptions is, while it's true, there must have been times where Asia wanted to rip your head off Joe and you mm. know, Joe wanted to rip your head off Asia. The other thing that's true is at some point you looked at this person and you said, this would be a really good person to do projects with. Mm. And you and you followed through on that thought. You subsequently went on and have done projects with one another. Mm. So my questions would be like, yeah, I understand. Sometimes the way he chews his food drives you crazy. <laughs> or, oh my God, that's so true. <laughs> or, or sometimes the way he, she does such and such drives you crazy. But can you take me to the moment before you met them? What was it like to discover that you were meeting someone who would professionally change your life? That mm-hmm. just does something. You know, that just that, that just does something to you. No, I can't it's just stop <laughs> But that's the point. That's that's the whole. That's the point of the of the approach. Is we should put, put love in our questions, and and we should put care in our questions, and we should put emotion in our questions, and we should put romance in our questions when we're talking about about couples. But we should really 
make our question delightful for people yeah. who want to answer. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. Joe, yeah. I love working with you. <laughs> and the thing is, Elliot, <laughs> you know, you know, sometimes when you're in a you're in a bit of a one of those moves where you deliberately want to antagonize somebody. So I'd, I'd slurp my tea because I know <laughs> that it would be annoying. Yeah, yeah but he, look, he looks up as he's doing it like, oh, oh yeah. she's going to go, she's going to blow, she's going to blow. <laughs> you know what's funny about stuff like that, Joe? And I can't help it. This is just how I'm built. If something tragic happened to you, the yeah. first thing Amy would say was, I miss, I miss him annoying me. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, that's true. She would say, she would say mm. I miss him slurping, the, slurping his tea. So even in the annoyance is beauty. Oh, you know now, I mean? I'm now, you're, now I'm going to have to just let him slurp his tea. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can, still, you can still punch him in. No, because now I'm going to think, oh, what if it's the last slurp? <laughs> 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 Thanks, oh, Elliot. You saved me there. Anything like, else that you want to get away with? I stuck but, you guys in. in, in, in I, I know. I know that Joe and I. Uh, we've been told that Joe and I influence um, most of this, our service users, our families um, that that see us in a positive way because they can see us. Um, you know, arguing, making up, uh, talking about things. They love our banter. So that's the way that we influence them. And in turn, we hope that they influence their families uh, because they leave our office feeling quite happy. Um, and we treat everyone, you know, in, you know, every, everyone can use a kettle, everyone can do what they want in the office. It's, it's home to home. So if we could just talk a little bit about couples and actually the way that they influence their children, whether it's, whether it's a happy couple or, you know, a couple that, um, are having some difficulties because we do have a lot of couples that on both ends of the spectrum where you know they, they parents don't realize how much their behaviors influence their, their their children's and how effective they are whether it be right. because of previous domestic abuse or current domestic abuse or just the way that they talk to each other right um so I, first of all i think we are always influencing each other all the time like we it, yeah. It's not like you, you are not influential when you're doing negative things and you are influential when you're doing positive things or vice versa. But we are constantly influencing our children. And we can even do that with our energy, right? Like, have you guys ever been around a negative person who wasn't talking, but you could, like, feel their negativity, right? Like, we're constantly in a circle of influence all the time. Well, mm. The reason why I think solution focus is just such a beautiful thing to do to a family if I start talking to a couple about what made you guys fall in love and how did you keep that going and what do you love about your partner and what do you love about your partner, the children benefit from that because now they're around two people who have shifted the way they look at one another, who have shifted the way they talk to one another, and the energy in the home changes. And, yeah. and also the way that the parents talk to the children changes because you once you change the way you start looking through glasses, Right when you mm. when you when you change the way you see things, then you change the way you see everything. Right? It's not like the glasses only work when I look at my partner. The glasses work when I look at like everything. Right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I, we've um, we've met a couple of um, uh, new people to solution focused, and. Um, because the way you explain it, it just makes perfect sense. But to someone who's new, it's kind of like, how, how did you keep your enthusiasm going? I mean, is it just a, a, a real genuine belief that people can do the right thing with the right conversation, that they want to make those changes? We just need to find a way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I 100% I believe, believe that people can get on with life after having an impactful conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so my job is just to have an impactful conversation and trust that people can get on with life. Mm. So um, um, have you ever doubted this way of working, Elliot? Has it ever, have you ever sat in a, a darkened room after a session and thinking, my God, that went badly. <laughs> I, don't <know. laughs> I, don't I don't know if I can carry this on. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I've never had a shred of doubt ever. I have, I have sat in the room and thought, 
holy shit, that was the worst therapy session ever happened in life. <laughs> but but that's that's me doubting me. That's me like Elliot failed, not the approach. I've never yeah. doubted. I've never doubted that a human being can have a conversation and change their life. That mm-hmm. that I've never doubted. I've I, I, been a terrible therapist at times, but I've never I, I, doubted I, that it can work. And that's completely spot on because um, and that's the way that we view it. And I think most SF practitioners, if not all, would view it as well. You know, if a session doesn't go well, then you kind of look at yourself and almost scale yourself and say, actually, what do I need to do in order for them to benefit uh, next time we meet? Um, it's, it's never the client. It's, it's, the, it's our language that we're using. It's, it's are they understanding what we're asking um, and kind of moving it forward from there. But it's so important to take ownership of the way that you that we practice it. A hundred percent. I mean, that, that is our responsibility. That's just like saying to like the head of a church, have you ever doubted prayer? No, I've never doubted yeah. prayer. Of course yeah. I don't doubt prayer. Like I, I believe in prayer, so I pray. Well, for mm. me, it's like I have a solution focused, so I solution. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> I believe in people's ability to change when they describe things. So I ask them to describe things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's... Uh... And, and Joe, Joe, if I may tell everyone how annoying I found Elliot a few years ago, where <laughs> we, he, was, he was teaching, or, <laughs> well, you traveled down from Texas to annoy me. <laughs> because annoy you were... You. Just to annoy me. Um, And it was a really, really hot summer's day in August. And it was a good, you know, you were kind of talking about how much the miracle question is worth asking and why. And you gave us an example. And you were, the woman had woken up and she was still in bed after half an hour. We went through all the senses, what difference it would make. If someone walked in, he would notice that she's smelling the roses or whatever, the way that the curtain was moving, everything. And I just popped. Did I, mean, I just popped. For God's sake, she needs to go to the toilet. We get it. We get it. You, you know, we get the detail. We get it. Uh, but like I said to you before, when we were in the green room, I have forgiven you for that, Elliot. I do Somehow but, I think being on the good side is a good thing. So I appreciate that. Yeah, but I became a better practitioner from that. Because I know how to really get down to the nitty gritty and you know, see things in minute detail. Thanks to that very annoying session that you delivered. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? Is people ask me all the time, right? They're like, how do you manage or what do you do if your client gets annoyed? And I'm always like, then they get annoying. I don't care. My job is to ask them questions that produce answers. Like, I'm not yeah. here to take care of your mood. I'm here. <laughs> you you like, know, that's his polite way of saying, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. I don't care it annoyed you. I'm not bothered. I came to London to do like- my thing. I wouldn't say I don't care. I would say that's just not the important bit. No, you know right, I mean? right, right. <laughs> Oh, how very solution focused of you. <laughs> well, and and, and uh, for anyone thinking, what are they talking about? I mean, it, it's it's kind of like the miracle question, Elliot. It's it's where we uh, get people to visualize um, a day when the problem is no longer affecting them so badly or is completely gone or, um, and it's that uh, that detailed description. Uh, I guess the devil's in the detail. The more you get, the more may stick and grow. Yeah, and I would say, well, first of all, I would say we've moved away from it's a day when the problem is there less or gone. I would say it's a day when their desired outcome is present mm. and the client the best version of themselves that they could envision. Mm. Uh, and a description of that day is just life-changing. I mean, it just, it's just 100% life-changing. Mm. Yeah. And you do it so well. Yeah. <laughs> As, 
As long as I annoy Asia, I'll keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe number two, he'll slurp and you'll do that. Okay, I'm, I'm, I, can, I can handle that. Yeah, him slurping I, in the background, me just... <laughs> I can totally understand. It was a very hot room with no air conditioner, no oh, fan. We were, we were up against the break. I know that she was ready to murder me. And we couldn't open the windows that, that week no. because there, were, there was roadworks or something going on outside. No. It was too loud, that's right. So the um, question is, how did we cope? Because, because I just knew you would cope. We, we, cope, <laughs> we cope because that's what we do. It's kind of like this COVID thing. For the last 10 years, I travel about 35 to 40 weeks out of the year. I have actually taught solution-focused therapy on every continent on Earth except Antarctica. Mm. And then all of a sudden, the pandemic happens on March 12th, and everything gets canceled. And people ask yeah. me, hey, how are you coping? I'm coping because that's what we do. That's what yeah. we do. And I don't know if you guys know this. If anybody out there is – how many people are watching? I can't see. How many people are watching this? Can you see, Aisha? Ten at the moment. All right, you guys, you 10 people, listen to this, because this is like, this is a big deal. I was watching a, a TV show. Do you guys have the Discovery Channel over there in the UK? Yeah. Okay, I was watching a TV show on the Discovery Channel that was about how human beings managed to survive all around the world. Because if you think about it, most mammals on Earth only survive in certain areas. Mm. How come? beings survived all around the world and they found evidence that human beings hundreds and hundreds thousands of years ago did a very unusual thing and they did it in Europe what happened was there was these these um there was this people that lived in these mountains and there's evidence that they lived in these mountains hunting things like sheep and stuff like that but then there's fossil evidence that the sheep went away so what these what these people did was they moved from the mountains and they just walked until they until they got to water, and when they got to water, they taught themselves how to fish. Human beings are the only ones who could adapt that way. Like human beings are unbelievably adaptable. Mm -hmm. So when people say to me like, "Elliot, how are you managing?" Because I'm a human being. This is what we were designed to do. Right? Mm -hmm. We were professional adapters. That is what we do. We do it all the time. It's in our DNA. It is how we do what we do. We adapt. So I just believe in people. I believe people can adapt in all situations and all things. It's just, it's just yeah. there. And, and I think, I think as humans, we are very quick. I know I certainly was before I was, I had SF in my blood. Um, but, you know, very quick to assume that people aren't coping and they're not going to cope with, with the news or, or whatever it might be, um, and I mean, last night I was I was part of a, a a conference regarding education COVID, and there was a lot of people assuming that kids aren't coping and parents aren't coping. Whereas actually, I think a lot of parents are coping better than everyone kind of thought. Um, and luckily, uh, luckily, the families that we have worked with, um, who are who have embraced the solution way of 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 working, are all coping really well. Yeah. And they're not even coping. They, 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 you know, they're doing really, really well because they've embraced solution-focused practices, um, and the kids love using it. Yeah. Look, it is hard, but we are getting on because that is yeah. what we do. That is what we do. Yeah. If, if and when we get through the COVID nineteen crisis, it will be the one millionth global crisis that human beings have endured. Like we have been in surviving crisis since time has started. So what makes this one any different? It is hard. We will get through it because that's what we do. We get through hard things. So when I'm working with clients, I just trust that they can do hard things. I don't know if you guys can see this, but I literally have a tattoo that says, I can do hard things. Can you see it? How do I don't do this. That's because you're hard, Elliot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the wrist. Yeah. Yeah. It says, I can do hard things because I'm a human being. Human beings can do hard things. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's our makeup. Well, we yeah, we we survive. That's that's why we've become so successful. I guess it's it's in our like you say, it's in our DNA. Because uh, I, 
we don't have venom. We don't have fangs. We don't have claws. We don't run fast. We don't jump high. We can't fly. We can't swim. The <laughs> only thing we can do is adapt. That's what we do better than anything else on the planet. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've uh, when when COVID first came in, I was um, when I was when I was um, zooming people, and I was I was asking them how they were coping, and then I was starting to think, why am I assuming they're not coping? Mm. Um, because that's kind of how you do it, you know. Um, how are you? How are you coping? But um, I've, I, I don't ask that so much anymore. It's kind of like, so uh, what have you been pleased to notice since we last spoke? And and sometimes it can be the most smallest thing. But when they start talking about those, you 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 get other things. It's kind of like a snowball effect. They start Absolutely. to realize. Um, Actually, I'm doing I'm doing all right. I'm doing okay, considering the circumstances. Um, Absolutely, I'm hanging in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Elliot, so, yeah, go on. Sorry, there, there was there was something that you that you told us a few years ago. I think it was the first solution focused um, summer school that Joe and I attended about a boy who his father you know, dragged him to come and see you. And I think he was very good. He wasn't a basketball player, he was something else, but he didn't talk for a few sessions. Football, football and player, he, yeah. Football, yeah, and he had his hood up. Yeah. He, he had his hood up for a few sessions. And I just want you to kind of very briefly tell everyone about that because that's something that I obviously haven't forgotten about. Um, mm -hmm. And that that story right there was just, that is what keeps me going with, when kids do turn up with their hoodies and they don't want to talk. Um, and I always remember that story. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this kid, I'm trying to be quick. It's hard to tell this story quickly, but it's 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 impactful, right? So I always talk about people, because one of the big questions we get from people is, what do you do when the client doesn't answer your questions? And um, I actually think it's impossible. I think clients answer your question every single time. And I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to you. Um, let me see. How am I going to prove this? Joe, yeah. What was? Can you tell me the last meal you ate? Yep. Do you want to tell you what it was? Tell me the last meal you ate. So it was. Uh, it was toad in the hole, which is. Do you know what toad in the hole is, Elliot? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's nothing no. fancy, mate. It's just sausage, of all things. sausages in batter with mashed potatoes and beans. Okay. Now. Of all of the people watching live, leave a comment if you answered the question I asked Joe in your head. Leave a comment right here if you answered the question that I asked Joe, specifically asked Joe. Let us know if you answered it in your head. Just say like yes or me or something. Raise your hand, whatever. Just let us know that you answered the question in your head. Now in a second, a lot of people are going to say, I did. Because what humans do is we answer questions we hear. We can't help it. It's just what it's just what we do, right? So with this particular kiddo, he comes in my office. He's got his hood flipped up. He's got these headphones on. And I said, what are you best so from our talking? And he didn't talk. So for like 20 minutes, I was like, so if your mom would hear, was here, what would she tell me? His father, who was in the lobby, I was like, if I could go ask him, what would he tell me? And he doesn't answer. Like, he, he just doesn't say anything. At the end of the 20 minutes, I said, is there anything I could have said that you would have answered? And he didn't answer me. And I said, well, I guess, I guess I'm done. And he got up and flipped his hood and he left. Uh, I saw him over the next couple of weeks, and he still didn't answer my questions. He eventually started talking to me about, like, football and girls, but he never really, like, participated in therapy in an overt way. Uh, the next time I saw him was four years later and he was in college having a very successful life, uh, coming back to therapy to tell me that how much the previous session had helped him. Um, so it's, it's so important. We put these things on our client, but it's like the client's not answering. Yeah, he is. He's just not giving you the gift of knowing what his answer is, but he's answering. And as long as I can believe he's answering, then I have to do my job and keep asking him questions. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that takes some uh, 
I, I, that takes a lot of belief in the client to 100%. know that he's answering in his head. He's answering in his head, but not out loud. A hundred percent. With with solution focused practices, if if you know, if as as we all know, if you don't have hope that the client can make change, and if you don't have, if you don't believe the client is capable of change, there's no point in doing it. You know, just quit your job and go work somewhere else. Not only not only should you believe your client is capable of change, but you've got to believe that your client is actively, currently changing right now. Mm. It's just, are they, do they believe you deserve to hear about it? Yeah. That's the difference. Mm. And in that case, I didn't deserve to hear about it until he decided to come tell me four years later. Mm. Yeah, that, that story stuck with me, as you can tell. Uh, that that story did stuck with me. Uh, because it's an incredible story, and it kind of gave me. Because I think at the time, for me, it would have been more like, well, if he doesn't want to talk, then he can go away. Um, no. um, but but like I said, thanks to you a lot, and, and a lot of SF practitioners, a lot a lot's changed over the years. But I think that was a moment where I thought, actually, yeah, you can answer those questions, um, and we don't need to know the answers. No. No. I don't need to know the answers. I just need to know he's doing his job. And as long as he's sitting in the seat, he's doing his job. The yeah. wonderful thing, the demonstration of participation, that to be very honest with you, at the time I didn't notice, but uh, that client, that teenager, didn't get up and walk out. So I should have treated him like a very active participant, but he did not get up and leave. And as long as he was in the room with me, I had a job to do. Wow. <laughs> and that's uh, so you're asking all these questions and, and basically nothing was coming back. Nothing. 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 Verbally, at least verbally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah nothing verbally. He did not. He didn't even blink, man. He didn't say. <laughs> he didn't, but he didn't get up and walk out, which to me, very respectful behavior of his dad, who was out waiting out in the lobby and of me. I mean, he didn't talk, but he didn't do anything rude. He didn't. Yeah. He didn't swear at me. He didn't. He didn't do anything. He just sat there, which mm -hmm. honestly is very high levels of participation because he could have done something really different, and he didn't. Yeah. yeah. So what? Uh, what exciting ventures are you up to at the moment, Elliot? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I got some stuff that I don't know if I should tell people yet. So I think, here's what I'll say. If you guys want to hear about what I have coming up next, mm -hmm. join my email list. Rolling across the bottom is my website. Go to my website and join my email list. You're not already on it because I have two really cool things that I'm going to be releasing or, or I'm going to be talking about coming up soon. Uh, and, and most of the stuff I share is completely free, right? So I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to share that stuff. So I've got a really big webinar coming up that won't cost you anything. All you got to do is, oh. and it's going to have, it's like Elliot and the rock stars. It's not just Elliot. It's like, <laughs> it's like Elliot and the Beatles, you know? So, uh, so we I, can I gotta, join that, right? You can join that, right? You can join it live. Uh, we you. typically have about, we typically have about 2,500 people signing up for my webinars. Um, so, and it's, and they always sell out 2,500 people sign up to get into 500 seats. So um, when I send you the email telling you about it, like make sure, look at that cute, hello. <laughs> Don't encourage her. Sorry. I was, we, so we had like a, a, a local uh, SF conversation conference that Joe and I kind of put on here. And I, I, <laughs> sorry. Um, and I was happy with 32 people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thirty-two is awesome. Uh, thirty-two is awesome. Uh, we so we, that, we get more than that. <laughs> we get a lot, but you're not going to tell well, us what. The, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I can't tell you what it is yet, man. That would give that would let the air out of the balloon a little bit. But I, <laughs> I will tell you this. Okay, how about how about if I block Joe out and then you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, social distancing is protecting him from Asia, so you can't like you yeah, can't yeah. properly him out now. Uh, 
So we have this big, awesome webinar. And again, when I email it out to you, make sure you sign up really quickly because usually we have about 2,500 people sign up for 500 spots. And then uh, I'm going to be doing an online conference that, oh. that, is, that should actually be described as like an online solution-focused party uh, coming wow. up in just a bit. Uh, so be on the lookout for that too. So those are the two things I have coming. I've got lots of stuff that I do all the time, but those are the two that yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm really excited about. I want you guys to, to hear about. Well, I mean, um, like I said earlier, you are when I said you you you're very sharing. I mean, I'm I get emails from you all the time, so I'll be looking out for those. Yep, look out for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good. yeah. Joe, sign me up if you see it first. <laughs> and what about the um the university elliot oh yeah so that is uh going super cool mm -hmm. we have hundreds of members from all around the world it is the largest library of solution focused training material available in the world and all you got to do is go to join the sfu.com to sign up uh, we typically don't leave registration open but we've opened it through May, so it's going to be open for the next few days, um, just to give people something to do, be entertained and trained by as we're locked in our homes. Uh, but the SFU is really cool. It literally, it's like we have lots of live stuff, right? Like Friday practice calls and a monthly coaching call. We have monthly supervision. But the big draw, honestly, is it's the largest library of solution-focused training material available in the world. Wow. Excellent. I'm a bit obsessed about making sure people know how to do this work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you've got loads of um, inspirational stuff on your YouTube channel. Yep, yep. If you go to my YouTube channel, I make a video a day, um, and I upload at least one video every day. And um, hopefully people find that informative and inspiring. Mm. Yeah, we do. We do when we're, when we're delivering training, we do kind of refer to that as well and tell yeah. them that we're, we're better than you are. <laughs> That's harsh. Yeah, that is harsh. I'm just joking, Elliot. I'm just joking. I'm, I'm not honestly joking. Uh, but but it, it, it's it's a re it's really really good, especially especially when you have new members of staff on board. You have volunteers. Yeah. Um, it's definitely our go-to place, so we really do appreciate that. So, yeah, in terms of in terms of you getting into solution focus uh, therapy, yeah, I know, I know I know some of the people that that have inspired you because um, you kind of given a talk about that before. But historically, so not not kind of the brief team because we know the brief team have inspired you a lot and you work very very closely with them. But if we look back yeah. into the sixties, seventies. Who would you say inspired you the most? So I am a big fan of the work that went on at the Mitchell Research Institute, Dr. Milton Erickson. Because um, when I got interested in Stephen and Sue, I wanted to know what inspired their work. And that took me to mm -hmm. Palo Alto, California, the Milton Research Institute, and the work of Milton Erickson and Bill O'Hanlon. So I would say the historical figures that inform my work the most are Steve DeShazer and Sue Kimberg, Milton Erickson, the MRI team, and Bill O'Hanlon. I would say those are the five historical figures. And Bill, if he watches this video, which he very well will be watching now, he will punch me in my eyeball for calling him a historical figure. But I say, <laughs> that, I say that with all of the love in my heart, bro. Like you are my homie and you know it. Uh, but I would say those are the five historical figures that uh that i'm most intrigued by even to this day mm. wow and it's it's such a it, it it's a way of working that seems to have spread out of the therapy world really effectively because it's not just in uh families and couples but it's in businesses it seems to have a a, a really good you can adapt it quite easily well, I, I think that's true because you know, it, because it's not really a way of working. It's a stance that informs your way of working. So mm. if you take on the stance, then it, it informs the way you work with your team at work, it informs the way you parent your children, it informs the way you relate to your partner, and it, it informs the way you work with your clients. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. And in terms of, because um, I know you said you travel, you've you've travelled everywhere <laughs> apart from Antarctica. Um, Which I'm you, to, by the way, I'm going to go to Antarctica. No. <laughs> so, in terms of, um, I don't know what what you've witnessed from delegates. Is there any? Is there any particular countries that seem to to take it on board a lot more readily? Are, are people more resistant in certain areas, or have you just found it's been really positive? No, no, no. I I think there is no difference in South America, in Russia, mm. Africa, in New Zealand, in Australia, in Canada, in Canada, mm. Poland. Like, there is no difference because. Human beings all want the same thing, and that is hope for a better tomorrow. Yeah. The one thing I will say, can I share a touching story with you? Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I went to South Africa to teach, I was teaching for three days in South Africa. And the host, the woman who hosted me in South Africa was a woman named Jackie. And she said, um, Elliot, I want to introduce you to this woman. And she brought me to this woman, and this woman had tears in her eyes. Um, I had just taught for for just like the morning session where we're about to go on lunch break on day one of three. And Jackie says, I want to introduce you to this woman. And she has tears in her eyes. And I asked her if she was okay. She said, yes, I'm okay. She said, I, I come from, I can't remember the name of the country, but it was about two or three countries north of South Africa. She said, it took me three days by bus through the, through the African jungle to get to Johannesburg. And every single night I slept in the bus hoping that I could get here on time to participate in this training. And I just want you to know that I've just been here for the morning and it's already been worth everything I had to do to get here. Wow. So I said to that woman, I said, why would you go through all of that trouble just to get to this lecture? And she said, the, the tribe of people I come from, we don't really have like words for feelings. My language, my natural language doesn't really have feeling words. So psychotherapy and coaching isn't very effective because there really aren't any words for feelings. So if yeah. you ask someone from my people, how does that make you feel? We can't answer it because we, we can't translate that into our language. When I heard about solution focus and I heard about the way that you do it, you don't ask, how does that make you feel? And you ask people to describe their hopes. And my culture is very much rooted in hope. And I would have given anything to hear the way that you talk about it. And I was just blown away. So now, like, we're about to go to lunch now. I'm crying, she's crying, and Jackie's crying. Um, but it made me real, like, when I, go to, when I go to New Zealand and you talk to people of the Maori culture, you, when I go to South Africa and I talk to Zulu, then talk to people from the coast. Uh, you when you go to uh, meet indigenous people in Canada, like you meet, you just meet people, and people are just people. Mm. We want love, freedom, happiness, joy, and it doesn't really matter what corner of the work, world you're from. That's what we want, mm. and I think solution focused grief therapy lives in that place. Mm. So yeah. I think people, I think people just get on with it because we tap into what's the very best of human beings. Mm. Oh, what a lovely oh. way of putting it. <laughs> I don't know what else she could say after that. I, <laughs> I, I could say a lot. Yeah, go on then. <laughs> it, it's, about, it's about stopping me from talking, really. So we, we, we've kind of met these two, and that, that's an amazing story, by the way, and that's one that I'll probably refer to in about four years' time when we see each other. <laughs> Again, um, just like the football story. Yeah, we, we've got we've got a couple of uh, new, but very fantastic people that we met in the last few months who are very new to solution focused way of working, um, yeah. and they've naturally be it's been more problem focused, and then naturally because they're lovely, lovely people, they want to resolve people's issues. They want to yes. help people by telling them what to do. Um, yeah. And we, Joe and I, are trying to encourage them, along with Tara Gretton, who is our, our tutor on this course, that, no, that's not what we do, and these are the reasons why we don't. But why shouldn't we tell people what to do, Elliot? Because you have to understand the difference between being useful and being helpful. 
Mm. Like, I don't I don't want to be helpful. I want to be useful. And I'm going to cite my guy Evan George for for yeah. helping me have that language and help me understand the difference. But like like I see your daughter there, Aisha. Like you could help her by tying her shoes for her. Or tying but her is that you? <laughs> <laughs> but but is that is that useful for her? No. Because I have to let her do it on her own mm. so that she can master the skill and carry that skill yeah. with her going forward. And yeah. oftentimes our our motivation to help people is A, wrapped up in our own need to feel helpful. And B, by helping someone, we're robbing them their ability to help help themselves. Yeah. So a solution focused therapist needs to understand this is a job about usefulness, not helpfulness. Wow. And that just rolled off his tongue. Did you? Did you? Yeah, yeah. He didn't even have to think about it. <laughs> he, he, he just went. Bleh, bleh, bleh. So, but, uh, so it's a it's a great analogy. You know, obviously. Uh, uh, she may need some guidance in tying her laces, but when she does it herself, the joy that she will get. Right. I mean, have you ever watched a, a child, but any human being, but most most observedly a child, do something that they didn't know they could do at the time they started doing it? The look of pride on their face is, it's worth living to see that look. Mm -hmm. Um. So when I do solution focus, I'm just not robbing any client of that look. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. See, I can't stop blushing again. Elliot <laughs> makes me blush. What a, what a lucky guy I am. I mean, <laughs> come on. My husband's not at oh. home. He's gone. I'm stuck with you two. I'm not doing too badly. I'm not doing too badly. <laughs> I'm not um, him you said. I, I, listen, he knows. Uh, because I'm all day, all day. I've been going. I'm going to see Elliot. 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 Yes, we know it's Elliot. But do you know who Elliot is, though? Why are you saying his name like that? Do you know who he is? Yeah. And it's like, no, I don't know who he is. How can you not who know who Elliot is? That's exactly. What is, What is he doing wrong in his life that he does not know who Elliot is? Exactly. Exactly. Right. But but you know what? I take full responsibility for him not knowing. Well, See? then you need to fix that. You need I, to fix I'm gonna, that. I'm going to have to fix that. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 think, I think you're an amazing person, an amazing mentor, and um, I just love the way the things just come rolling, rolling out, and it's just amazing. And I cannot wait to take part in another training session with you. Um, oh, and I won't, I won't be annoyed at this time. I'm, well, I'm sure you will. I'm up with new ways to annoy you, but uh, I'll, get, I'll get you. <laughs> But You're we'll, going to push it, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll join you on. Hopefully, we'll be one of the first to join this webinar so we don't Absolutely. miss it. Absolutely. Joe, Absolutely. I'm serious. Anybody watching, this, anybody watching this, head on over to my email list. Sign up for my email list because I got – you won't believe the stuff I'm working on right now to, to make 2020 the greatest year ever. And the first two things that I want to make you aware of are, are this webinar – and an online conference that I'll be rolling out later. I don't even like I don't like the word conference because it sounds super professional and all. It's more like a like an inspirational party to enthuse you, um, to like electrify you. Yeah. Uh, and like fill your heart with gold. That's what I would say. Yeah, I can't wait. I'm just gonna read um one of the comments that uh our lovely Grainer, who's one of the people studying who's new to solution focus. So shout out to Grainer and Clemmy. Oh my god, I just sounded like I'm a radio host. Shout out. Um <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a bit carried away with this. Uh so she said that was perfect. Thanks, Elliot, for such a great explanation to understand the difference. Mm. Uh, oh, which you're which which is which is absolutely brilliant, and I think you explained it so well. In fact, a lot everything that you said has been so useful, um, even to Joe and I. Um, and I have secretly been taking notes here, so yeah. to pull another Elliot. <laughs> I don't mind you pulling Elliot. To pull an Elliot, um, but it would be great if uh, if you can jo join us um, join us again, maybe maybe in a few weeks' time to have a conversation. Uh, but that was that was. Really, really cool, and we look for. We, we, so we're meeting other SF practitioners. Uh, I think John Wheeler next week we're meeting with. Um, 
he's 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 fantastic and i'm sure he's got some stories on in sue and steve i think he's met in sue a few times so that'll be absolutely great but i really want the i want the three of us to have a meeting with harry corman oh god <laughs> so i'm gonna i'm gonna share this with harry uh, who I mean, is on my Facebook. Oh god. you guys want to hear you guys want to hear a funny harry corman story please <laughs> Uh, I love Harry, and if if Harry, if we can set up a time where the three of us meet with Harry, I would love it. But Same. here's a funny Harry Cohen story. I'm a really good athlete. Like, I'm very good at sports. I'm very hand-eye coordinated. And um, Harry tells me that he and his wife enjoy playing table tennis. And uh, so I was in Sweden teaching. Harry invited me over to Sweden. I was in Sweden teaching, and I was staying at Harry's house. And they have a table tennis um, table in his house. He and his wife, they don't just like playing table tennis. They're like professional table tennis players. They completely destroyed me. So <laughs> I enjoyed the table tennis game so I can go back to um, Sweden and have a rematch with Harry Corman because he and he and his wife kicked my ass in table tennis that night. So embarrassingly bad. I have not touched a table tennis game since. But oh, I need to I need to work on go get a rematch. Yeah, it was back this way. It was very, very bad. <laughs> well, my Go my on. first my first encounter with Harry was at summer school. Um, oh, really? And he was there, and he was kind of he gave a little speech, and then we were all we all uh, I think Chris asked us all to pair up, um, and I was paired up with Harry. Um, oh, wow. So I, kind of, I sat down and, and it'd only been a few months since I started learning about solution focused therapy. And I sat down and every, and I can't remember the question that I was meant to be asking or the way I was meant to be asking it, but all he kept saying was start again, <laughs> start again, <laughs> start again. And that went on for, for, to me felt like an hour, but I think it was about five minutes. Start again, mm -mm -mm. start again. So, and then in the end, in the end, he just went, but he never once gave me the answer, not once. And then in the end, I don't know how I asked it, but he just went, much better stick to that. <laughs> and that was my experience of Harry. I can tell Harry is one of the best. I mean, Harry's just an amazing guy. I'd love to, if you can spit it out, I'd love to be on call with Harry. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to uh, get in there with Harry and say, hey, Harry, I prefer you to Elliot. Let's do this. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, a girl's got to do what a girl's got to do. <laughs> I, I won't say anything. I, I will allow it. Oh, that's will, thank, it. thank you so much, Elliot, for joining us. And honestly, guys, oh. please do sign up to everything that Elliot offers you. He is a fantastic mm -hmm. person to kind of know, team up with, go to his training, online training. If you, if he. If we ever have another opportunity where Elliot comes to London, I know that we'll definitely be there. Um, it's it, You are absolutely fantastic, and we thank you so much for being in our lives. Yeah, thank you, Elliot. It's been, uh, it's, it's been really, really uh, uplifting. Mm. It's, been, it's been really uplifting, and thank you for your time, because I know you're such a busy guy. So no to give us your, it's, it's amazing. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you guys for inviting me, and I hope to see you soon. Yeah, you definitely. Elliot, can I just ask that you don't leave the broadcast for a second, but I'll lend it for everyone else? Yep, I'll sit here. Just so I can flirt with you privately. <laughs> <laughs> see you later, everyone. Bye. Everybody, thanks for watching, too, by the way. Thank you.